Christ clean me up. Christ clean me up. I ain't got a stain and I'm feeling brand new. Yeah, 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 yeah. Christ clean me up. Yeah, I'm like this. The gospel, my friend, made me righteous. Now I'm walking like Christ in his likeness. I can't live the same, I don't desire it. Hold on, man. We're gonna do it like this. Yeah, I'm like this. The gospel, my friend, made me righteous. Walking like Christ in his likeness. Can't live the same, I don't desire it. Cause I admire him. Yeah, boy, I'm like this. The gospel changed me up, I got a new brain. Can't live the same, I got a new brain. New eyes, new Righteous all because of Christ did Be conformed to his likeness Me man's priceless Yeah, he didn't leave me in the muck and mire He constantly cleaning me up He giving new yeah, desires like By his grace ain't living the same Living in shame, living unashamed Living to give glory to his name Christians read we had a change of mind So we literally ain't seeing the same New frame, new frame yeah, boy, I'm like, yeah. yeah, my faith in God brought new actions Before I chase worldly passions Righteous, a hey, brother's no longer blind. Yeah, I'm like this. The gospel, my friend, made me righteous. Walking like Christ in his likeness. Can't live the same, I don't desire it. Cause I admire him. Yeah, boy, I'm like this. The gospel changed me up, I got a new brain. Can't live the same, I got a new brain. New eyes, new heart, can't do the same. Yeah, got a new name. Yeah, boy, I'm like this. All things theology. Things theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hollow because this is how we do it at all things theology. Yo, <laughs> grace and peace, grace and peace. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology. Where well, this is your host, Kato. If this is your first time to the channel, come on in, come on in. We're, you know, we're. we're we're, we're, we're friendly around here, you know? Turn off the lights. Mm. I have my Waterloo because we are going to need it today. Let me contextualize this. I was scrolling on YouTube and Mike Todd Sermon popped up and I was like, what is this dude talking about? And I literally just hovered over it. You know how you start hovering over the, the video? You can kind of already see what's playing. And I was like, this guy is in a, he's in a chair getting a haircut. I was like, what is going on? I kind of ignored it. I was like, I'll watch it later. I also watch it later. And I, I, uh, matter of fact, he's in the chat, pastor Trey, shout out to pastor Trey. Uh, you know, shout out to the pastors who labor over the text. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but I was like, I messaged him and I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we had a good laugh. And I watched the sermon. I was like, I gotta watch this. And it was bad as I thought it would be, but I got an email from a concerned subscriber, listener, uh, you know, anyways. <laughs> and I was, he was saying how much of a hater I am because this was Mike Todd's best sermon. And, and I, I was like, boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. No, 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 no. This is his best sermon. This is his best sermon. <laughs> it's not as worse. I'll say that it's not as worse. You know, no, 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 he, no. he's done worse sermons. I will grant that. I will grant he has done worse sermons, like him getting in a bed with a mannequin talking about women's cookies. Yeah, that's pretty bad. But this was pretty much Mike Todd trying to find an analogy between John 15 and himself. You know, it's, when I play some of this, you guys are going to be like, how, how is he comparing the Christian life, i.e. sanctification, with getting a haircut? Remember, the sermon series is called uh, Fresh Fruits. And this sermon is called Fresh, Fresh Cut. He needs some milk. Yes, Fresh Cut. That is the sermon. Um, l let me just say this. Th there are people who want to try to find some kind of modern day example whenever they time they preach the Bible. You know, you guys remember, uh, what was the pastor we covered a few weeks ago? Uh what Keon Henderson, right? He saw the word Benjamin and you know, Benjamin means in our modern definition, money, 
Benjamins. He reads that back into the story of, you know, Abraham's sons, Benjamin, and talks about how you need to give Benjamins. Like, you know, that is akin to the amount of study people do today when it comes to the Bible. We're going to do a lot of, um, we're going to be doing some scripture references today just to show, but I want to get right into this. I don't like wasting you guys time. I want to get right into it. But Mike Todd, is he's a man that's literally unable to teach the text with just the Bible. Right. Give Mike Todd just a Bible. You cut off all the shimmering lights and, you know, the uh, the, the seizure strobes is what I call them. <laughs> cut off all that. Give Mike just a pulpit and that guy is lost. He doesn't know how to get around the Bible. Anyways, we're going to show what I mean. Um, there's some bad examples, but we're going to watch a lengthy section here and we're going to talk about Mike Todd getting a haircut. I. I why are we doing this? Why are pastors doing this? You don't need shock value. And, and before we get into sorry, I do need to say this. Mike Todd is the superstar in all his sermons, right? Because the props, I mean, after you leave the service, what do you, what do you impress with? What do you remember the most? Christ? <laughs> my, my, no, you remember the prop and he's always the center of the prop because he's always doing well. Remember when you talk about the weight loss thing, Right. God looked around. He couldn't find nobody. But lo and behold, Mike Todd was the only one willing. This humble servant. I couldn't tell if it was John the Baptist or Mike Todd we were talking about. But we're going to get back to that uh, John the Baptist reference. So, Hi, my name is Amberly and I have the. Let's skip to around the 17 minute mark. And we are going to get to it. Let's go. That's the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce. Watch this even more <clears throat> somebody say more fruit say it like you believe it more fruit say it like it's gonna happen in your mind in your life more. say it like your finances is gonna reflect it say it like your family is gonna change more but you see it's always like you got to bring the finances into it right apparently if you're not you know rich you know you're you're, you're not bearing fruit so so i mean dang apostles shots right at the apostles right fruit when I look at my bank account this week, more fruit. I don't care what it says. When I walk into my house, what am I saying? More. F I might be at the brink of divorce, but I'm calling it by faith. More fruit. If you actually go list, look at the uh, fruit listed in Galatians, most of it is inward stuff. Because if we get if, if God gets the inward stuff right, obviously it's going to manifest itself outwardly. But Modern evangelical Christianity is all concerned with exterior, right? As long as you look holy, as long as you can clean that outside of that cup. Finances, right? C clearly, you're right with God. Your bank account's large. My goodness. But for more fruit, there's a formula. We've been talking about fresh fruit and fresh vision and a fresh church. You want more fruit? How many people want more fruit in the building? <laughs> DMX Get ready to scream for the title of the sermon. It's going to take a fresh cut. So he, he's, he's arguing. So, well, if you want more fruit, you got to get a fresh cut. <laughs> and I, I would argue actually something is more fundamental. If you want more fruit, you have to abide in the spirit. That's literally what John 15 is saying, right? A means of how God, you know, does grow us at times is outward trials, inward trials, but it's all connected to the spirit and divine being in Christ, right? That really wasn't touched on in this sermon. Oh. Oh. No, 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 no. What is he screaming Ooh. for? Hold on, a, a fresh cut, pastor? A fresh cut. You're witnessing history right now. Um, after 10 years of pastoring, um, I've never ever come on any platform without a fresh cut. Let, I got to do something first because I told someone I would do this. I have a new glossary. And this is very descriptive of Mike Todd. I'll, we'll get back to Mike Todd in a second. 
<laughs> we'll get back to Mike Todd in a second. I've co- coined a term that some people have liked, but I, but I think if I'm going to coin a term, it's right that I define this term. Because some people's like, what does it mean? And that is the term, ladies and gentlemen, gossip girl apologetics. Yes, gossip girl apologetics. And we have multiple, you know, uh, phrases. We have multiple usages of the word. So let's check it out. Gossip girl apologetics is the antics, acts, or statements of a person that are rooted in salon talk or messy behavior. You know, when the pastor's got to talk vulgar, you know, William Murphy talking about sexual relations and things like that. That is a example. It fits in the category of gossip girl apologetics. Let's go to definition number two. When a pastor is unable to teach the Bible and are very or heavily reliant upon props to assist their TED Talks. You know, they're not sermons. They're not rooted in the exegesis and labor of the Bible. Right. They're just a prop where he's just talking all day about the prop. Someone asked, did I come up with this? Yeah. You know, hey, look, I, you know, every now and then I get a little creative. But option three, which I think you guys are going to like the most zesty behavior from a pastor so this sermon is filled with gossip girl apologetics now my wife was a little offended she was like girl (laughs) men do this too and i'm like come on come on come on my love like just be a little gracious to me you know you get my point you get my point gossip girl apologetics let's continue and today i am up here straight off of vacation where i spent time a lot of time in the sun, S-U-N, and with the sun, S-O-N, as you can see by my complexion. Um, I, I didn't get a, a fresh cut, so I, I decided to use this as an illustration of what God's going to do in our lives. And I'm going to get a haircut on stage in front of you, something that is usually done in private. Mike Todd wants to act like he's John the Baptist in the wilderness. So, you know, I haven't got a haircut in a while. Here I come with camel's hair and leather, eating honey and locust. <laughs> he's got things like John the Baptist. Chill. I'm going to do it openly in front of you so that you can see the benefit of a fresh cut. Um, Aaron, my barber and friend, is going to come. Y'all give it up for Aaron real quick as he comes. Now, uh, this is my dog, and um, he, I'm going to let him set up, but he is actually terrified of what we're about to do. Yes, as is all the saints of God who want to hear Bible. (laughs) Because what I'm about to do is very dangerous. Because the level of passion that I preach with, and the level of wanting you to get it, um, really affects potentially. The- I wish he had that amount of passion when studying the text. You know, I mean, I wish he had that text. Why ain't no way, boy? Way that no somebody way, boy. Um, could actually cut my hair. And, and this is not rehearsed or planned or practiced. This is about to be very fresh. But I want you to know from the scripture, watch this point, write it down. I'm going to preach this whole thing. If you, if, if you thought we were in John 15, or if you're confused, he's apparently in John 15. And apparently what John 15 is analogous to Mike Todd getting a fresh cut. This is why I say Mike Todd is the star of this analogy. He's the star of this prop. Because he's the example of how I'm vulnerable. I'm going to show you deep into my life what it's like to get a haircut. This is dangerous stuff. <laughs> it's not dangerous to get a haircut. Stay still, dude. <laughs> um, while he's cutting me, he got the brother. How are you feeling right now? Are you feeling feeling you feeling great? Our friendship is on the line. Um, r- write this down. You're getting cut either way. You're getting cut either way. You about to? No, I don't. No, no, no. Not this black thing. Today is watermelon. I don't want this. Use my cape. Boy, ain't no way, bro. Boy, ain't no way. Bro. There we go. He needs 
Got to be on brand. Thank you, Jesus. I love how he says, none of this was playing. None of this was playing. But he pulls out a random, you know, <laughs> a random, you know, cape to put on. And it's uh, Gossip Girl Apologetics brand, right? This is straight out of <laughs> Zesty.com. Uh, and he puts this on, right? No, not the black. I need the, I need the watermelon cape, right? Like... <laughs> Yeah, this wasn't planned. Sure, you just happen to have a a cape matching your wardrobe. I mean, who who is the star of this, right? I mean, he, he, who is the star of this? I, yeah, totally, totally Jesus is represented here, right? Somebody say you're getting cut it either way. It, it, let, let me say this, because this, this sermon analogy actually doesn't fit the point of John 15. John 15... What he's trying to say John 15 means is John 15 is about ultimately, you know, if I'm being gracious to him, being disciplined by God. Nobody goes to get a haircut at that barbershop to get disciplined. You go there to look good, to look fresh. Some of you go there to look vain. And I'm not saying going to get a haircut is sin. Please hear me. But I'm saying that the getting a haircut, getting a fresh cut it's not discipline. It doesn't hurt at all. As a matter of fact, it feels good to get those edges sharpened and, you know, hit like you want, you know. But you know what? This sermon doesn't make sense. You know how it doesn't make sense to the Christian life? What about bald people? <laughs> what about females? I mean, this sermon only fits people who have nice hairlines, you know, generally, <laughs> or who can do the enhancements. We're going to get to that in a second. This is God's process. Cutting is God's process of eliminating what isn't producing fruit. <laughs> it's not a haircut. It's also his way of expanding what is producing fruit. So if you don't embrace God cutting you, you are not actually getting the best out of what you have. So going to let me let me let me make sure I get this right. Going to get a haircut is akin to sanctification. <laughs> this is what Mike Todd does and you and pay attention when you hear a sermon they'll have a point they want to preach so bad they go find a text and then they leave that text for like 20 30 minutes and they the next 30 minutes is literally a tech talk about the original point right um someone says side note I went to middle school with this barber <laughs> well you need to you need to find this man right but this getting a haircut is not akin to the Christian life of sanctification, which is really expressed in John 15. Yeah. And Cephas makes a great point. What about those who cut their own hair and can do it well? Now, he's going to bring that up a little later, Cephas. So he's he's coming after you in a second. Yeah, dear world Christian, all the bald people in the chat, you can't compare to this analogy. Apparently, God has already got the best out of you because you're already bald. <laughs> he's nothing he can work with, I guess. Yeah. And one cut is going to cause you pain. Remember the scripture says. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Getting a haircut literally doesn't. I've, I have had over, I'd say to say probably thousands of haircuts. And maybe every once in a while they, when they do that, but it's comparatively is not, it's not painful. I mean, you know, it's, it's not painful to get a haircut. So, and it's not, it's not for sanctification purposes like John 15. Like if the barber did that, it's because he messed up. Clearly God ain't messing up. So what's the point of this analogy? It makes no sense. This is goofy. This is bread in my pocket energy. Anybody who's not producing fruit, he cuts them off and throws them away. So you got to get a haircut or God, God's done with you. But the people who are producing fruit, he cuts them so that they can have more fruit. What I found out is one cut is full of pain and the other cut is full of promise. <laughs> what are they screaming about? What I'm about? trying to get everybody in this room under the sound of my voice to realize is God... In 2024, when you yell by faith, more fruit in my marriage, more fruit in my finances, more fruit in my business, more fruit in my family. He says, let me grab my scissors. Are you ready 
to be cut. The thing that really brought me a lot of peace, because when I was asked that by the Holy Spirit, am I ready to get cut? My answer was no. Because all my life, cut has been associated with something that is either bad, hurt. Imagine going to church and you literally see your pastor like this. I would be so ashamed, right? You invite your friend to church, man. My pastor, hey, he brings that word, bro. We're, we're deep in the text, bro. He's, he, you know, hermeneutics, exegesis, right? All of that. And you go in here, your pastor, he's literally getting a haircut. And literally for 40 minutes, this man is talking about getting a haircut, trying to make an analogy fit into the text of John 15. I can't imagine. Not, not me. Not, not my pastor. No, 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 no. <laughs> Full, painful, or, or an accident that could end deadly. Uh -uh, don't Look. <laughs> I've never known anyone to go get a haircut and have died from the razor blades. <laughs> don't play with them scissors since you're young. No, 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 no. Don't use that knife. But God said to me, he said, Michael, being put, cut by me is a promise of more fruit. He said, so when I start to cut on your life, I'm promising you, I'm planning to use you again. Now, I want to make this point because Mike Todd thinks because he can find the word cut or, you know, make some analogy of being cut, which I don't mind that point. I'm talking about being cut. He thinks because he finds cut in the Bible, that justifies him getting a haircut on stage. That would be akin to finding the word clean in the Bible is a just like it would be akin to getting a shower on stage because you found the word clean. At this point, what's stopping Mike Todd for literally getting up stage and getting a, getting a shower because he finds the word clean? Like at this point, where is the line? Where is the line transformation church to where you guys will say, I just want I, I just want to know what the what the text says. You know, the Bible says elders are to be able to teach and this God is able to talk. He can talk for, for a long amount of time without any Bible. And just because you can say b biblical things, you can say God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean you're preaching the text. Just because you can even quote a verse, it doesn't mean you're able to teach a text. See what, I don't know if anybody ever played on a basketball team, but... But I was one of those on a team that the coach would always ride me harder than he would ride anybody else. He's the star of the show. And I was like, coach, you don't be telling them that. He says, shut up and run. Coach, they missed the shot too. He said, I'm not talking to them. Coach. Well, I, got a, I was a crier when I got angry. Like when I got really angry. Do I got any angry? Like when you get like real, the tears just start falling. They, they thug tears. Believe that. Yeah, the first time I watched this sermon, I was angry crying. This is, this is silliness. These antics make me angry. You better believe that. But you get so overwhelmed, it's got to come out somewhere. You... <laughs> Comedian Mike Todd. And one day the coach brought me to the side. He said, Michael, the reason that I ride you so hard and I correct you so hard and I talk to you so hard is because I know that you actually have potential to go where none of these other people have <laughs> potential to go. And so this is supposed to be an analogy to what God is telling him. God condescends to the humble, lowly John the Baptist, I mean Mike Todd, to tell him, Mike Todd, the reason why I ride you so hard, I'm like your basketball coach, I ride you so hard because you better than these ignorant, no dribbling, can't cross over nobody itself, and you got, you got more potential to make it past these scrubs. <laughs> My goodness, the humility is great. So if I don't cut you now, you won't be ready when it's time for the competition. And I just came to tell somebody that the church has been a bad, done a bad job in this last season of emphasizing how comfortable serving God would be. 
I need to say this to you. Like, just come to God and all your fears and all your tears and he bottles them and he's going to coddle them. And, and we make you feel like when you come to God, then somehow it gets easy. That's been y'all with the prosperity gospel. Come to God. Matter of fact, he said that earlier. You'll produce all this more fruit if you if you pretty much do all the things he's saying. That's the prosperity gospel lie that you have been teaching. Right. More money, more problems. Right. That's the whole thing you were teaching. When you, when you came in like a wrecking ball, Hannah Montana style, talking about if you tithe, your life will get better financially. You're preaching against your past self. I'm thankful for it. But you show the inconsistency, inconsistency, because the next sermon will probably be about fresh Fresh finances, <laughs> you know, it'll be the thing he's saying, stop doing. It's it's people who have opposed prosperity gospel who says, no, Christians will suffer now. Anyone who desires to live a godly life will suffer. No servant is greater than his master. If Christ has suffered, we along with him, we share in the sufferings of Christ. Guess what? Guess who highlights those? Not the prosperity gospel pimps, not the mega, not many of the mega church guys. It's the guys who are faithful to the text, who preach the word of God, who, as a matter of fact, preach all of it. We don't just preach topical stuff, right? You got to get away from topical because what topical sermons usually end up, not always, is the pastor's favorite sermons. So guess what? He talks a lot about money, right? Because he, he doesn't have to do expository preaching, line by line preaching through a whole book. You know, I don't think Mike, Mike Todd could even do that through a book of fighting, even let alone Romans. And I just want to let you know that our desire for comfort has made us despise his cut. I'm going to say it one more time. You think if God tells you no, you're getting punished. Instead of if God tells you no, he's protecting you. You think if God doesn't allow you to get the position you prayed for, that somehow he hasn't heard your cry. But he actually is answering the prayer you didn't know how to form in your lip with your lips by not letting you get into a position that you would be locked into because he knows you're a people pleaser. And if you got that position, you wouldn't leave there for 15 years and three years from now. He's going to open up the actual destiny step that you need. So he told you no now to lead you to the place of purpose. You know what's wild? I just This is just hit me. This man is saying all this while getting a haircut. Now, I know that's the obvious, but literally every time he says something, say, wow, this man is getting a haircut during this. <laughs> it makes the sermon even more crazier. But if you desire comfort at the expense of desiring the cut, not from anybody, just regular. I'm talking about from God. You will miss out on what God has for you. I wrote it down like this because I just came back from the beach and I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to give a praise report. I know these, we don't do testimony service anymore in church. Listen to the praise report. You think it's how people got saved or how somebody's been more holy or, you know, God has healed the sick in this church. Listen to the praise report. <laughs> but I want to give you a praise report. I've been to the beach a lot of times and me and my wife did a little withdrawal trip and I just needed to be refreshed. And I'm encouraging every person to pick time where you actually get refreshed. I know a pastor doesn't usually tell you that, but Jesus modeled it or God modeled it in creation. And he literally took a day of Sabbath to be able to recreate. And so I'm just asking you to do the same. God took another day on the Sabbath to recreate. Huh? Huh? Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Why you always lying? Why what would you, you say that? Why would you say that? It was just my imagination. Running away with me. What did he recreate on the Sabbath? On the seventh day, what did he recreate? What what is he talking about? What li literally what is he talking about? And we have to be careful with the language of God resting. That's not God, you know. It, and maybe I have to do a video on this. That's not God. Like, woo, man, them six days are rough. <laughs> you know, that's not that's not what it means when God rested. It's actually God taking a step back. And enjoying his work that he's done. He's satisfied in it. You know, the psalmist talks about rest in that way too, where the king is literally satisfied in his his kingly ship. I you know, I want I would want to bring that out.
But God isn't like overworked. He isn't the, you know, the the minority worker who's just been getting overworked, over underpaid. You know, that's not what it means when God rested. But that ain't my point. While I was on the beach praise report, I felt more comfortable in swim clothes than I ever have in my life. So the praise report is Michael was feeling himself. <laughs> he was feeling himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Todd was feeling himself. Don't get, don't worry. So when now watch, because the definition of cut is about to change. Now, some of y'all won't shout with me, but you weren't with me when I was 275. I was so ready to take my shirt off. No, no, no. I'm just serious. I was like, what are we wearing today, baby? I was getting my bathing suits ready. I wanted to color coordinate. I want you wearing pink today. I wear pink today. I was. Gossip Girl Apologetics is live in full effect right now. But what I, what I realized is my comfort on the beach came from the cutting in the gym. So now cutting, cutting has taken a whole new meaning. First, it was, it was, you know, being disciplined by the Lord. Now it's him working out. And so John 15 is now about getting cut up. You know, I be trying to leave Mike Todd alone, but. Every time I try to leave, something keeps pulling me back. So Mike Todd, he's been doing extra curls in the gym, and that's the praise report. The praise report is Mike likes how his body looks. <laughs> Surely is this something for worth praise. Uh, he makes it hard. Your comfort comes from a place of cutting. You want comfort in your marriage? Go get that cutting in counseling. Listen. Just just read your Bible and obey what God has said, because now he's trying. Yeah, he's got the Greek definition, right? He's, he's taking to the take you to the Greek. He's going to the Greek to give us what cutting really means. This cutting season. You ever seen those from the bodybuilders? <laughs> it's cutting season <laughs> during the winter. I was, you know, I gained some weight, you know, to, to help me keep warm. But now nah, it's cutting season. Yeah, it's beach season. What I got to do with the Bible? So apparently when Jesus walked on the beach and, uh, they ate fish and all that. Jesus might have been cut up. He was, he was cut up on the beach, taking his shirt off, flexing with the disciples, with his boys, you know. They had a large one or something. See, see, when you try to modernize so much of the Bible, you have to insert and change even so much of it. You know? Yeah, Benjamin becomes about money. Cutting becomes about getting cut up and working out. This is so bad. The fact that people are literally uh, screaming, and it's mostly women, let's be honest, up here screaming over this gossip girl TMZ style apologetic is actually one of the most saddest things when you take a step back and you look at it, right? That, that's the sad part. Take you to the Greek. Yeah, yeah. Take them to the Greek. You want cutting in? You want comfort in your finances? How many people would love for their finances to be more comfortable? Come on. Okay, y'all, come on. You want your finance? You got to cut it up. That makes You got to cut it up, right? Give me a cut, right? That's You want your finances, right? Let me tell you what God told me. You got to give me a cut. <laughs> see, see, you can do this with anything. You know, so anything in your life becomes a sermon. You know, you start taking out the trash, you know? You take out the trash in the morning, that could become the sermon for that day, right? See, God wanted me to tell you, listen, listen up, saints. He told me as I was taking out my trash, he wants to take out the trash in your life. A lot of these Christians is ducking the smoke. Right. I want all the smoke. He want to take the trash out of your out life. Out of life. Out of life. And he told me to, to, to tell you some. Good God. Some good God news. Stop giving them some ideas. Hey, I, I, I'm preaching. See, see, this is what happens when you're when you want to make your life, your experiences and project it into the Bible. You know, we we did a we did a video not too long ago where we talked about this um, perspectivalism. Big three dollar word. All that means is perspectivalism is where you do what it, he's doing. It's very subjective. You, you, you already have your sermon. And now you find key words you want cut, right? Uh, and then you can find that in the Bible. Fruit, you know? And this is supposed to be about something that you're preaching about. It has no actual connection 
to the text of, of scripture. There's no exegesis. There's no he didn't have to labor for 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 uh, for days, 40 hours this week to come up with this. You could have literally had this before. Yeah, yeah, sis, I got you. If you ask, you shall receive. I got you. Prophesy. Prophesy. He literally thought about this sermon probably on Friday and Saturday. He started working on the little, you know, the little connecting points. You didn't have to work too hard for this sermon. Someone says, how does he come up with these, these sermons? I got you. With just my imagination, running away with me. It's all in his head, all in his imagination, you know, but uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to skip. We played like, um, let's see, we played like 10 minutes straight right there. I'm going to go to a section because this part is actually the worst. Guys, prepare yourself. If you thought what we what we've been talking about has been bad. It's about to get worse. It's going to make you say something like this. Jingle bells, jingle bells. I'm not going to hell. You know what I'm saying? Wait a minute. Who are you? Who are you? Yeah, it's about to get worse. So let's listen up. With all the things that God's given me and God's saying, surrender. What's another word for surrender, Pastor Mike? Sit down. <laughs> What's another word? Uh, I don't know if that's a <laughs> sit down is actually not a synonym. But anyways. For sit down, Pastor Mike. Stay still. What's another word for stay still? Write this one down. Abide. John 15, 5 goes on and says, yes, I am. the." But, but again, this a sermon of getting a haircut has to do about John 15. I just want to refresh your memory. I know we're slow to, you know, we, we, we're forgetful. We're forgetful people. Hey, that's why the pastor has to constantly remind you. Right. <laughs> I like what Paul says. Hey, to preach the same thing is no shame to me. Right. I got to keep. But so I'm reminding you, apparently this is all about John 15 still, just in case you forgot. True vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I am them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> this is a wild image. This is a wild image. Translation, it says those who abide in me. So if you notice, he's getting his enhancements right now. So here comes... Are, 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 you thought we were done with the haircut analogies? Here comes the uh, enhancement analogy. Here we go. Some of y'all have been moving too much for God to cut where he needs to and it not kill you. And God's saying, would you just stay still? Would you just plant in a church? Would you just actually continue to go to the B group? Would you actually submit to counseling? Would you actually do that? Would you actually just stay still in a place long enough so I can do this surgery on you? And some of y'all are like, what is he doing right now? This is what in the barber world they call enhancements. Yeah, this is a black thing. Some of my less melanated folks... You may not know about enhancements or, you know, some of the white men, you know, hey, hey, look, I, I got y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all do the gist for men. <laughs> y'all take the back, right, and go, bring it to the front, right? But black people got something called enhancements where they essentially fill in your imperfections, you know. Uh, but watch this. See, when you get a master barber and they can see what you don't see, they can fill in the holes and the gaps. The areas, y'all be like, dang, Pastor Mike Beard be so nice. That ain't me. We know. That's the grace of God. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying to you. It presents me in a way that my own effort could not present. It gives me the ability to be able to have the appearance of what's not really mine. It kind of sounds like salvation. It kind of sounds like any man that be in Christ 
He is a new creation. So when the debt comes up for all the sin that I made, I get the enhancement of Jesus Christ being the one that stands in front of me and fills in every gap, every hole, every area that my hair could not grow, every area that my life could not produce. He does not look at me. Listen, sir. Jesus Christ is not your enhancement where he's just filling in the little imperfections of your life. Christ died for your Christ died for your professed righteousness. This sounds like Christ is just making it better. You were doing okay, but let me just fill in those gaps for you. Christ is not a mere enhancement to your life. He's a substitution for your life. You don't need to just add, add a little, you just got a little enhancement. You weren't, you weren't that bad. Your beard is okay, but I can make it just a little bit better. I can make it a little spiced up. That is not the Christian gospel. That is not the gospel that the Bible talks about. He substitutes for us. All of us. Even the things you think are good, Christ died for that too. Because even your good deeds, sir, even your good beard is filthy rags. Even your goodness Christ died for. Because it's rubbish apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ. See, Mike Todd has a bad anthropology. He thinks he's just going around and he's doing okay. All he needs is a little lineup. No, sir, you need the whole thing removed and have your life replaced by the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's not just filling in your gaps. All of you is corrupt. All of you is wicked. All have gone astray. See, when you don't know the Bible, and I see someone calling me a Pharisee, but I'm just quoting Bible. <laughs> I'm a Pharisee. He's got the gospel wrong. You know, that's just the easiest, easy thing to you know, say when you don't like what they're saying. He, he's just a Pharisee. I'm grounding my disagreement in Bible. I know you don't like it. That's because you're a heathen. <laughs> if I'm the Pharisee, then you're the heathen. See, when you have a fundamental view of man that says they're okay going along in life, they just need a little enhancements, a little touch up. Let me just touch you up. You're, you're not bad, but let me, I, I'm a master. I could, I could add a little goodness in your life. You fundamentally tell people they're not that bad. Just if you call Christ, you'd be better. No, sir. All of you needs to be done away with. And Christ is all our life. He is our complete substitution. You don't like this? You're dealing with something other than Christianity. Call it Mike Toddism. Call it whatever you want, but it's not Christianity. You can call me a Pharisee all you want, but this is what the Bible teaches. Notice the gospel that you call, that I'm preaching, that I'm literally just quoting, you call a Pharisee, sir. There is no hope unless you repent. That's right. That's right. Um, Smart Christian channel. The the Pharisees were, Pharisees were not out there uh, preaching sound doctrine, contrary to some people's opinion. They were preaching their traditions and placing it over Bible, like Mike Todd. What he just said is not what the Bible teaches. Not at all. You can get upset for me for it. But I will not sway by the grace of God away from this truth. The gospel is important, guys. The gospel is important. We get the gospel wrong. I don't care what you get right. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Guys, see, see, fundamentally, people think that. You know, they can just say something creative and, and, and you know, wise, right? Because they, they, they think God needs your little Broadway channel, they, your Broadway acts. Let me, let me read some scripture real quick. I've been doing enough talking, but I've been quoting scripture. Notice what the Bible says. You know, I know, I know today we, well, the spirit is moving. My friend, the spirit speaks what the scriptures speak. Notice what 1 Corinthians 1 says, for, for the word of the cross is fully Folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The sermon of the sermon, I will thwart. God doesn't need your, you know, your, your creative ideas. Where is the one who is wise? 
I love this when I go preach the gospel on the street. Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? God doesn't need your wisdom, sir. The scriptures contain the wisdom of God. And yes, I'm zealous right now. Going on for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I love that verse because if you actually realize what's saying, it's saying even in the quote unquote foolishness of God, it's wiser than the world. See, the world thinks, oh, man, God needs a little help to reach the laws, right? They'll never come if I just preach what the Bible says, right? So I got to spice it up, right? You, you might have heard something to this vernacular, right? I, I, I got I to gotta do X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, they'll never come. But what you win them with, you have to keep them with. If I win a regenerate, born-again Christian with the God's word, guess what? All I got to do is simple. Preach God's word. But if I win them with the cakes, candy, and games, I always have to give them cake, candy, and games. See, this is fundamental because ultimately what, what, what Mike Todd and other people are trying to do is win you with something other than the word of God. But notice this verse, verse 22, Jews demand a sign and Greek seek wisdom. I love this. I love this. So what do Jews want? They want a sign. But what do the Greeks want? They want wisdom of the world. So we have two audience demanding we give them what they want. But what is the Apostle Paul full of the spirit says? We preach Christ crucified. In other words, we don't give them what they want. And that's a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. We're the stubborn DJ. They want their song. But, sir, we only have one song to play. And that's gospel. I don't have a remix for you. I only have this song on the track list because I am an ambassador for Christ and I only play, I only move to the sound he has instructed us to. Yeah, the world will demand all certain, th certain things of you. You know, I, I really think if you preach like this, that would win more people like me. Well, sir, be gone. <laughs> be gone. I, I don't make apologies for what God has told us to preach. Right? For the full, but to the, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You want to be wise? Preach Christ and his word. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let me finish out to the end of this chapter. This is just so good. Verse 26, for consider your calling, brothers. I, know, I love how Paul reminds us <laughs> of this. You think you're great? Not many of you were wise. <laughs> I love the, you know, the accidental, you know, humbling of the saints. You weren't wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. It's like you, you don't come from nothing. But God chose what is foolish in the world to Shame the wise. So not only does God choose the foolish, the means of how he grabs the foolish people out of the world is considered foolish by the world, too. Look, at the end of the day, God says, go preach a text. Now, the world says, oh, that's that won't get people in. You're just sharing what God has said. Amen. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring nothing, things that are. So that no human being may boast in the presence of God. My friend, our preaching is in such a way that we don't point people back to us. The preacher is to point people to Christ and Christ crucified. That's what, that's what Paul said. I desire to preach nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. The person and the work of Jesus is what we desire to preach to the world. Not how, look how great I am with my, with my props and, and, and analogies. Point people away from yourselves. As Shai said, the world can't, end, the world can't un understand. They aim to a discover why we aim to exalt the, hold on. He says, why we, why, we, why we aim to exalt the one of another. Yeah. The goal of the Christian is to exalt Christ. Lift him up. Magnify. Lift him up. Lift up Jesus. Not ourselves. Woo. 
And because of him, that is God, the father, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that is as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I pray that you have been encouraged right now because that's what it's about. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you want it? You got it, brother. What does the word say? What does? What does the word say? The word say. What does the word say? For the spirit of God always points people to the son of God found in the scriptures of God. See, we don't have we don't have creative license to just say, well, the spirit of God led me to this and then not be found established in the word of God. The spirit of God is not some kind of subjective thing you appeal to, to when you can't find something in scripture. Well, you know, the spirit told me if the spirit told you, he's going to confirm it in his word. You know, I, 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 I am frustrated with this idea that the spirit and the Bible are fundamentally opposed to each other. No, the spirit and the words, my friend, the spirit and the word of God. They agree. They agree. When you became a Christian and the spirit uh, bore witness to the son, it was not just disconnected from what the scriptures were saying. It was rooted. See, ultimately, this is why you don't need a teacher, you know, in a regeneration sense. I actually want to deal with that in a video soon. But the reason why you don't need a need the scriptures because the spirit is bore witness to the things in scripture. Now, I'm not saying you don't need a pastor. Don't hear that. Don't don't hear Kate up saying don't go to church. Hopefully you understand the distinction I'm making here. The spirit and the word of God go hand in hand. And it's all to the glory of God. We're saved in Christ alone to the glory of God alone. In scripture alone, leave it all alone and alone in scripture. Guys, we need to bring back a, a, um, a high view of the scriptures. If someone is telling you, see, I, I am, I am a, a, a you know, call, call me a, you know, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm, I'm losing my tra train of thought for the word, but whenever someone comes to me saying, God said this, sir, I'm a Berean. Show me in the Bible. Show me. We are to be Missouri Christians. Show me. You got to show me that. You got to show me. So many people have so many Christians, professed Christians lost because they said God told me. And that's supposed to be the catchphrase all for, well, I guess I got to believe it. Right? No, no, no. Right? We were saying we're to say this to that. No, 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 no. Sorry, I'm I am I am zealous right now because I have been maybe it's because I've been reading Catherine Crick's book and I plan to do a review on that. But uh, someone said I am legit crazy. Hey Amen. I am a fool to the world. May I be? May I? May I appear crazy for the hopes that you actually read your Bible and know it? Yeah, we're fools for Christ's sakes. Hey Amen. I take that. I take that with a compliment, sir. That. My preaching of the Bible has, has caused you to call me a fool. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> don't, don't make me bust out in a hymn in here. I'll do it. <laughs> I will do it. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. May you call me a fool for Christ's sake. Amen. Let me, uh, <laughs> man, I, I am having fun just. You know, glorying over the word of God. I, I am, I am, I am got, uh, you know, hyped up on the word of God. Yes, yes. You don't have the scriptures without the spirit. It's the spirit who illuminates the scripture. It is not one or the other. Amen. My brother Rick, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. My pastor agrees. I can confirm K-Dub is a fool. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm a fool for Christ's sakes. I go on the streets and by the spirit of God who, who has caused me to know the word of God. Amen. Call me a fool. We are, we are all fools for Christ's sakes. 